Psalm 44. One time I was getting ready to preach and the musician who was singing right before I preached gave not quite the same testimony as Dick did just then. But he gave one in which he began talking about the blues, Christian blues. And he said, you know, I wondered why we don't have many good Christian blues songs. And then he said, then it dawned on me, Christians don't get the blues. And then he said, so now I want to sing to you a Christian blues song. (laughs) I was so confused by the time I got up there to preach. First of all, he was wrong. We do get the blues. And in fact, blues is not simply a genre or a style of music uh, that Christian folks deal with or even secular folks deal with. Now, I love good blues music. I, I can listen to it all day long. And recently I was listening to one song, and it's a good blues line here where it said, My mother is the only one who loves me. And that was good enough, but then it went further and said, and she might be jiving. (laughs) Now that's the blues. That's the blues. And even in biblical literature or Hebrew literature, the Psalms, that great gathering of prayers and poems and songs to the Lord. Some of them are grand and majestic as the the people of God would sing on their ascent to the hill of God, to the mount of God, to Zion, and they would sing great songs of triumph and joy. But there were other times like this time that we're going to look at today where It's not a time of great celebration. In fact, it's a time of questioning and it's a time of hurt and sorrow and anguish. And I know I'm preaching to some folks today who should be glad there's that kind of psalm in the Bible. Because you've come into this place today and you're you're hurting. Your soul is just heavy and dark. And for too many occasions, it seems like those who bear the name of Christ simply say, in effect, Don't worry. Be happy. And that's not at all the full gospel message. There are times when we ache, we hurt, and we sorrow, and we weep. And even in times when we don't do those things, the Bible tells us that we are to weep with those who do weep and mourn with those who do mourn. So we come to this place where as as we unfold this psalm and dig into it a little bit, I'm simply going to call it the dark night of the soul. It's a phrase that's been used for a long period of time because people have often gone through it. In fact, not only is it something for the blues music and something for the Old Testament, but even in modern verse, it is something that still rings out there. The American novelist F. Scott Fitzgerald said in one of his works, in a real dark night of the soul, It is always three o'clock in the morning. You understand what he's saying, don't you? Some of you 
your clock set at three o'clock right now. In fact, the pop rock band Matchbox 20 has a song titled 3 a.m. and it says, one of the lines says, and the clock on the wall has been stuck at three for days and days. And another rock band lyric says, it's the dark night of the soul and temptations taking hold, but through the pain and suffering, through the heartache and trembling, it's not a pleasant place. And before we go back and read the rest of the psalm, I want us to zero in on the last part of verse number 19, where the psalmist is making complaint almost to God the Father, and he says to him, and you have covered us with the shadow of death. You've covered us with the shadow of death. That's the dark night of the soul. That's when it's pitch black. It's when it hurts so deeply, you don't think it can hurt anymore. And to better understand this, we're going to, we're going to kind of unfold this chapter like a good crime mystery. You know, a good crime mystery starts out with the crime occurring at the beginning. And they let you know what's taken place, and then there's a flashback. So we're going to, first of all, go back to the day before or the days before the dark night to see what leads up to this dark night. So let's take a look. Psalm 44, beginning in verse 1. Oh God, we have heard with our ears. Our fathers have told us. What deeds you performed in their days, in the days of old. You, with your own hand, drove out the nations, but them you planted. You afflicted the peoples, but them you set free. For not by their own sword did they win the land, nor did their own arm save them, but your right hand and your arm and the light of your face for you delighted in them. And so if we go back to those days before the dark night shows up, it's a day in which the psalmist is rehearsing that for generations, God, you have blessed your people. Our forefathers have told from generation to generation about your mighty works. They've not trusted in their own strength. They've not trusted in their own weapons. They've not trusted in their own ingenuity. But it was you, O oh God, who brought out Abram from the land and gave him a place and gave him a people, and you blessed them. And I like the way it sums it up when he says, the light of your face, for you delighted in them. That's where we want to be, isn't it? Where the face of God is upon us. That's the old blessing from Numbers, that the Lord may bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you, because when he does that, it's a sign that he delights in you. And so when we look back, we can see <coughs> our own biblical history of being able to follow in the footsteps of not only the Moses and the Abrahams the Davids and the Daniels and the prophets, but also in the disciples and the apostles and in Peter and in Paul. And we stand in that line. And this is an important time of, of church history as well uh, coming up this week. And I hope that you'll celebrate on the 31st Reformation Day. Uh, 499 years ago, Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the church door in Wittenberg, and began the Reformation which we stand in its, in its wake today. And so we have that history, and we can look back to the past and see what God has done. But the psalmist also recognizes that not only did God shine his light on our forefathers, but he has shown his light on us. Look with me in verse 4. 
The psalmist declares, you are my king, O God. Ordain salvation for Jacob. Through you we push down our foes. Through your name we tread down those who rise up against us. For not in my bow do I trust, nor can my sword save me. But you have saved us from our foes and have put to shame those who hate us. In God we have boasted continually and we will give thanks to your name forever. God has shone his light on them. He's shined down upon them. And we know that joy of standing on the mountaintops and experiencing the wonderful gaze of our Lord, of feeling the warmth of the rays of his light, of experiencing the great hallelujahs and our heart be overflowing with a joy unspeakable and full of glory. We understand that. We understand that. But when we stand on the mountaintops, and we see that amazing view. And we see on the horizon an even larger mountaintop. The way from one mountaintop to another is through the valley. It's through the valley. I've stood at the base of the Matterhorn, not the amusement park ride, but the mountain in Switzerland. I didn't try to climb it, but I stood up on another mountain and at its base could see the Matterhorn rising in the sky. Just stood there in awe of our great God. But then my eyes looked down, and at the base of the Matterhorn, you'll never guess what's there. No, it's not a souvenir stand. It's a cemetery. And in that cemetery are the markers of men who tried to climb the Matterhorn and failed and fell to their death. You see, sometimes with the heights, there's also the depths. And so we may have experienced, experienced that great euphoria, that great joy, that great hope that, that just keeps us shouting, and we want to shout it from the rooftops, but sometimes those bright, shiny, glorious days transition not only into night but into the dark night of the soul the dead of night where not only is the sun gone down but the moon is nowhere to be found and the stars twinkle not a bit and it's simply dark Now, the psalmist isn't the only person in verse 19 who speaks about the shadow of death. But let's just listen to actually how he does speak because we see such a great transition in this psalm. It's going in one direction and just makes an abrupt stop and turns and goes in the opposite direction. He's been talking about how God has blessed their forefathers, how God has blessed them. He's given them victory over their enemies. He's given them great delight and great joy. And then verse 9, he says, But you have rejected us and disgraced us and have not gone out with our armies. You have made us turn back from the foe. And those who hate us have gotten spoil. 
You have made us like sheep for slaughter and have scattered us among the nations. You have sold your people for a trifle, demanding no high price for them. You have made us the taunt of our neighbors, the derision and scorn of those around us. You have made us a byword among the nations, a laughingstock among the peoples. All day long, my disgrace is before me and shame has covered my face. The sound of the taunter and reviler at the sight of the enemy and the avenger, all this has come upon us. Though we have not forgotten you and we've not been false to your covenant, Our heart has not turned back, nor have our steps departed from your way. Yet you have broken us in the place of jackals and covered us with the shadow of death. If we had forgotten the name of our God or spread out our hands to a foreign God, would not God discover this? For he knows the secrets of the heart. Yet for your sake, we are killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep. To be slaughtered. It's a little different than those first verses, isn't it? It's dark, it's gloomy. It's it's, It's the sense in which they think God has rejected them. He once blessed them, but now he's rejected them. It's what it seems like. Now this shadow of death, this dark night, that that phrase or that word that's used there in verse 19 when it says you've covered us with the shadow of death, it's used but 18 times in the Old Testament. And 10 of those are found in guess what book? Job. Job. Job says in the midst of his dark night, in the midst of his sorrow. Job says he wishes that his birthday had never occurred, that a deep darkness would have claimed it. He speaks about this valley of the shadow of death being one without any order. It's one where there's weeping, where there's terrors, where it's like a mine in which ore is searched out, but the miner finds only gloom and deep darkness. Speaks of his own death, coming death, as going to the land of deep shadows and not returning. You see, that word is a compound word, which the first part of it means a shadow is from a mountain. And then... The second part meaning of the place of death. That instead of simply getting a little relief from the heat of the sun, that when you, that mountain stands there at times, you may get what is referred to throughout the scriptures as a place of death. There's that kind of shadow. Now, I know we're very familiar with it when we talk, we quote Psalm 23. But I suspect that that's one of those places where we've so quoted it and we've so recited it that we just kind of roll across it without really grasping its meaning or taking it to heart. Because when we read the 23rd Psalm, we're... We we leave shouting, we leave rejoicing, we leave thanking God. But it's in the midst of that psalm in verse 4 where he says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you're with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, Granted, we should focus on he's with us, and that gives us the reason not to be afraid, but it doesn't take away from the severity of the valley itself. It's not just some hiccup that we overcome or God takes us through. It's deep, dark gloom. 
In Psalm 107, the word is used to describe prisoners who are bound with irons and sitting in affliction. It's used in Jeremiah 2.6 to speak of the wilderness in which there are deserts and pits and droughts and deep darkness. It's a place that nobody puts on their bucket list. Nobody sees their travel agent to sign up for a tour. It's a dark, dark place. In fact, it's so dark that the people of Israel here, the psalmist here, feels as as if they have been cursed like Satan. Look again with me at verse Number 25, for our soul is bowed down to the dust. Our belly clings to the ground. Can you hear the echo of Genesis 3.14 where God, after Satan had deceived Adam and Eve, can you hear the echo of God saying to Satan as he cursed the serpent, on your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat? You see, the psalmist is saying, Just like you cursed the devil, and we know how that turned out, that's what I feel like. Why does this happen? Why does God send us through those dark valleys? Why does God give us those dark nights of the soul? Sometimes we go there because of our own sin and rebellion. Now, that was not the case here in the Psalms. They've said, we've kept covenant with you, O God. We've not raised our hands to another God. We've been faithful to you. It wasn't that they had sinned, but sometimes sin and rebellion against God will send you into a dark dark valley. Do you remember when the son said to the father in the parable, give me my inheritance. And he took it and he went off in sin and rebellion against his father. And he partied away and lived in riotous living, one translation says, until he found himself broke and eating the slop reserved for the pigs. I know that story. Almost 20 years ago, I had been serving for a good while as pastor of churches and God had given me great opportunity and great privilege, not only to know him, but to preach his wonderful gospel. And one day, just like that boy in the story of the prodigal son, I took what he gave and I began to live in riotous living time I was pastoring a new church start. Those in the congregation now are some of those who write books for the Christian community. I was doing doctoral studies, the leading seminary in the land, was teaching Seminary classes. Was working in the evenings as a librarian at the theological library. Bought a house with kids and a wife.
and I fell willingly into a black hole that instantaneously cost me my marriage, my ministry, my church, my education, my job, and I found myself laying in a bed with a, by bed I mean a mattress laid on the floor so close to the refrigerator I could open the refrigerator from the bedroom. Alone. In a matter of just a few weeks and short months, I lost 60 pounds. That was the good part. And when men of God began to speak to me words calling me to repentance, I ran even faster. So that if you had met me in those days and not known me before, you would never have known that I came from a godly family, was raised in a godly church, knew anything about the Bible or knew anything about God. I lived there. Till those nights when I would cry out, God, how? Do I get out of this mess? And slowly, very slowly, God would send somebody who would speak words of wisdom into my ear. And I'd open up my Bible and words would come alive. And I'd hear something that would make me say, but in my father's house, and God reached down that long road and drew me back to himself. I still bear the scars. I still remember the sweat and tears and blood in the three o'clock hours. But God was gracious and granted forgiveness. You see, sometimes the dark night is a result of sin or our rebellion. But sometimes it's not the sin. Now, we all have sinned, and so in essence, there's a little bit of a connection there between our sin and our struggles, but it's not always that way. For in John 9, Jesus is walking with his disciples, and they see a man who was born blind and is still blind, and the disciples said to him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned, or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Sometimes we go through the dark night so that the works of God can be displayed. Now, one of the questions you have to ask yourself is, in your Christian faith is, are you willing to go through the dark night not because of some stupid thing you've done, but because God simply has his works to display. You know, almost without fail, when we look at history of God doing great movements across this globe, those movements come when he first sends great darkness and great despair. 
And all that's left is to call out to God and say, God, if you don't save us, we won't be saved. And so sometimes it's for the sake of God displaying his works. Sometimes it's simply because, well, we don't know why. Do <laughs> you remember all those times when Job discussed the reasons why he was, or he discussed going through that dark valley? He finally says to God, God, why? And God has a long discussion with Job. And he's, at the end of it, we close the pages on the book of Job. And you know what the answer was? We still don't know. When Job reached the end, he still didn't know why. And sometimes we won't either. The last thing here is that the dark night sometimes is simply for the gospel. It's for the gospel. One other place this phrase, the shadow of death, the valley of the shadow of death is used is in Isaiah 9.2. Very familiar verse, we use it around Christmas when we talk about the coming Christ, and it says, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shined, has shone. You see, it's a prophecy of the coming of the Messiah, the coming Christ. That's why in verse 44, chapter 44, verse number 11, it says, you have made us like sheep for slaughter. You've heard that before, haven't you? Verse 22 says, yet for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Now I ask you, who's the sheep to be slaughtered? It's the Lord Jesus. Isaiah 53, 7 says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb, he was led to the slaughter. And then you hear John the Baptist, Baptist bellowing in John 1, 29, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You see, the dark night of the psalmist was a foreshadowing of, of the gospel, the foreshadowing of the Christ who was to come. You say, well, we're not foreshadowing that anymore. Well, we might say, for us, we're a backshadow of the gospel when we suffer. That's why when he quotes in verse 22, when he says in verse 22, yet for your sake we are all killed, we are killed all the day long, we're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Paul picks up on that and quotes it verbatim in Romans 8.36 after he declares that Christ was given over by the Father for us on our behalf. That therefore joined with Christ, we will never be separated from him no matter how dark it gets. And so the psalmist in his dark night was foreshadowing the coming of Christ. We who live on this side our sufferings backshadow, pointing as well to the Christ who has suffered on our behalf. In fact, one more good reason to know that this is the truth about this is that when we look at verse number 24, he says, why do you hide your face? That first word, why, that's the question, why? But it's the very same word that Jesus echoed or spoke on the cross when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why? For what reason am I being abandoned? For what reason am I being rejected? And just like Jesus had been praying that whole night before in the Garden of Gethsemane, he kept praying to the Father. I know we Plan this from eternity past, but remind me one more time. Remind me again of the price and what it's going to be paid for. Remind me again that it's the redeeming of people for your glory and for your fame. And so it's a pointing to the cross. That's why 
the writer of Hebrews says that we're to look unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God. Do you notice how he phrased that? The joy was set before him. It was it was not resting upon him. It was set before him. First, he endured the cross. You know, we've just done a whole series on Philippians and joy in the midst of suffering. But sometimes that joy is just here while we endure our cross, while we endure that which will fill up the sufferings of Christ, where we endure that which will point us back to the one who gave his life for us. And so, in the end result, as the dark as the night may become, we still worship a God who is the God of light. And in the darkness, sometimes all we're left to do is simply cry out to this God that he would send forth his light That's why in verse 23, he finally gets around to actually making a petition, asking God for something. He's described his situation beforehand, and he says, Awake, why are you sleeping, O Lord? Rouse yourself. Sometimes we pray that, God, let the dawn come. It's been dark long enough. Now, it's not that God is asleep. But the psalmist simply felt like God was not paying attention to him. And so we pray, God, look upon us in our hurt and our suffering. So we pray heartily. We ask God to look upon us and that his face would shine upon us again. That his face would shine upon us again. They had asserted, remember in verse 3, that God had shown his, the light of his face upon their forefathers, and then they pray again in verse number 24. Why do you hide your face? God, pull back the veil. Show us again the light of your glory. So we pray heartily that the dawn would come. We pray with eternity in mind. They, they had said earlier, God, you've rejected us. But now in verse 23, they pray, do not reject us forever. Forever. Maybe for a while it's going to happen, God, but we come with eternity in mind. And sometimes when we pray for relief, it happens instantaneously. And sometimes it works itself out over time. And sometimes we won't feel it until we get to heaven on the other side. Are you, do you realize we may have signed up for that? challenge is to keep our eyes focused upon him even when we suffer. Paul prayed. He says, do you remember how he said it? Thrice. Three times. Which is an expression of terms which means I prayed over and over and over again. And over and over and over again. And God finally said, not taking it away. My grace is sufficient. But we pray on the basis of God's steadfast covenant love. A lot of times with these psalms, you get to the last line, and it kind of sums up what you need to know. And he says that the very last line, redeem us. For the sake of your steadfast love. That's his covenant love. His love that does never fail. It may seem like it's failing, but it doesn't. He's still walking. He's still there with you. He's still supporting you. He's still strengthening you. He's still giving you breath. 
He's still the one who is steadfast in his love and mercy for us. And we pray on that behalf because we're in covenant relationship with him. That's why we do the Lord's Supper to say this is a new covenant of our, that was before us. A new covenant. God's written it on our hearts. And when we have that covenant relationship, we will continually have the Lord Jesus at the right hand of the Father interceding on our behalf. That it never get to be too much. Now, maybe it's too much for us to bear, but not too much for him to bear. And he bears it through us or for us. So the mountaintops, they're great. The days of sunshine and having his face shine upon us, they're great. But deathly valleys do come, and when they come, we pray. We pray that the Lord will be with us and rescue us to his glory. Pray with me. Father, I know that there are hurting men and women in this place. Would you walk with them through those dark valleys? And Father, would you deliver them from those valleys? Maybe some of them or all of them even. Maybe today you'll take them out to where the dawning of the new day will shine. But if, Father, that dawning is not until later will you give them the confidence and faith that you're a God who will walk beside them and be with them. Thank you for the Lord Jesus, that he walked through the darkest valley of all on our behalf. He bore the pain and agony of the full cup of your wrath upon sin for us. And God, if some are here today walking in the dark valley that are experiencing some of your wrath, May they escape that wrath by calling upon the Savior who will take their place. For we love you, and it's for your great name that we pray. Amen.